And I'm honored to be able to talk to you today and to describe to you some of my passion for doing science. Um, I've been a geek scientist for 30 plus years and a natural scientist like all of us probably starting at age two. Um, I think the message that I would try to leave with you today is that there is a scientist in all of us and today I'm even going to appeal to the geek scientist in all of you, I hope. I'm going to try and tease it out of you and leave you with what I think is a real need that we have in the civilization that we live in today, which is that we need, we need skeptics. We need people willing to question authority and we need, we need this, this, this principle of, of scientific judgment. So that's, that's the message that I hope comes from this talk. Um, Maui is a very good place to do science. I won't dwell on this, but you know that we're transitioning to a four-year college and there's a wonderful partnership that's developing between a research-focused institution like my own um, and a teaching-focused teaching institute like the University of Hawaii Maui College. I think that's the future, to build the bridges that make our young students um, aware and capable of, of judging science and working with the tools that we do as researchers. Thank you. It, it doesn't come as a surprise to you that you, you may know and it's been said that the amount of information that you have to process now is a hundred times more than the information that your mother and father processed. Science isn't about facts. At any time you can pull out your phone and you can have any fact at your fingertips. Science is really about inquiry. And inquiry is about this ability to frame questions, to ask questions, to find data, and to evaluate it for yourself. Unlike the past, you have at your disposal enormous amounts of information, and we have to teach ourselves the tools to be able to judge, independent of authority and independent of all of the other repetitive messages that we're bombarded with. So, it goes back more than 10 years, this concept of inquiry. Within UH Maui College, we're beginning to teach courses that focus on this, this idea that asking the questions and learning how to ask questions is really the important part of teaching. So it was about 70 years ago that a very famous physicist sat in the audience like this. There was another presenter who was presenting some discussion of theoretical physics. And Wolfgang Pauli was heard to turn to his neighbor and said, that's not even wrong. Now, this isn't a nice thing to say to a colleague. And in fact, it, it illustrates that science has to be wrong. In fact, good science aspires to be wrong. Science, science is different than anything else we do in that, in that it will always be supplanted. Right? There'll, there'll be a better theory, a better observation, and it will modify what we, what we recognize as fact. Science is, is distinct, right? Beyond science lies cultural principles. Those are established by social consensus and religious tenets. Those are established by faith. Unlike cultural or religious claims, a scientific theory has to be disprovable. And not only does it have to be disprovable, but it has to agree with all the data. Any single piece of data disproves a, disproves a theory when it's within the realm of discourse of the theory. And that's a very important point that distinguishes what is science from what is culture and what is religion. So what I'd like to do with you today as I extract the geek in you is to do an inquiry. Let's construct an inquiry, and it's an inquiry which is relevant to all of us, I think. And the question that, that I have focused on in some of my research over the last few years is this question, is the Earth's climate affected by the sun? So I have to give you some facts, and I'm going to have to show you some graphs. Um, but let's start with the sun. As you know, the sun drives all of the, all of the climate that exists on the Earth. Um, but it's variable. These are, this is a movie sequence that was taken a few years ago right around Halloween. And it's notable because during these few days of this movie sequence, those big dark spots that you see rotate across the sun produced the biggest outpouring of solar energy that wasn't just the standard luminosity of the sun 
that we have ever recorded. We think back in the 1800s there was a big burst of energy, but since the 1800s, this is the biggest thing that we've ever known. And it was associated with those dark spots that you see rotating across the sun. We call those sunspots. Um, the scale is enormous. Any one of those groups is several times the size of the Earth. And luckily, this outburst of energy when it took place released most of the radiation and the particles off to the side, so it didn't strike the Earth. But nevertheless, it affected our technology. It rerouted planes. You may have known back in 2003 around Halloween that your GPS didn't work quite right. It had an effect on us here on Earth in a very tangible way. So one of the messages I'm going to leave you with is that to do science, we have to understand not just the apparent relationships of objects, but we have to understand the causal relationships. And in this short talk, we're not going to understand climate change. In fact, one of my points is that nobody yet understands climate change, but we can understand some of the ingredients. There are really only three things you need to know. Well, four. The fourth is the principle, and we'll call it the principle of balance. If we know the brightness of the sun, and astronomers call that the luminosity, and if we know how good the Earth and the Earth system is at reflecting energy away, and we call that the albedo, and if we know how good the Earth is at emitting the energy, we call that the net emissivity, then those three quantities, when they're in balance, allow us to know, in principle, the climate of the Earth. And we can describe the climate of the Earth with something like an average temperature, and that's what we'll talk about in just a minute. So the average temperature is a measure of the climate of the Earth. And these three quantities, they're not simple. There are hundreds of thousands of lines of computer code that go into computing the luminosity, the albedo, and the emissivity. And a lot of the things that go into that you've heard of. La Nina is part of this. Carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases are part of the emissivity. And the sun, many people believe, doesn't have a very large part of the story. But I'm going to try and argue to you that as scientists, we need to revisit that common conclusion. So there are roughly 100 papers published every year that are comparable to the one I'm going to talk about. A couple years ago, Judith Lean, who is a friend of mine, compiled a lot of the computer data. She compiled all of the solar data, and she reduced the information of, of the, those three quantities into a series of graphs. And the graphs are interesting. Um, the top graph up here, that dark line, represents what you know. That's a, that's a measure of the average temperature, or we'll think of it as the climate, of the Earth over the last three decades. And it shows what you've, what you've been told and what you've heard, that the temperature of the Earth has been going up, and it's gone up by a few tenths of a degree. It shows also what you may not have known, but the temperature of the Earth reached a peak in, in, in the late 90s, and it dropped down, and it's been gradually increasing, but in general, um, it shows lots and lots of fluctuations. So what Judith did was to compute the luminosity of the sun and its effect on the temperature of the Earth and the albedo um, from things like the La Nina effects and ocean circulation um, and the effect of volcanic aerosols in the atmosphere that reflect some of that energy, um, and carbon dioxide which, and the greenhouse gases, which affect the ability of the Earth to radiate energy into space. And she converted those into temperatures and she got each one of these curves, and they show a temperature change, the net effect. Um, the albedo uh, and the effects of La Nina are here. And she added them up, and she said, that's, that's this orange curve right here, and she said, we're done. We understand climate change. Her conclusion was that all of these little tiny effects add as small perturbations, that climate is in fact rather stable with tiny changes in time, the effect of the sun is pretty minimal on this scale. These, each of these plots has the same scale. And that, as you've heard, the effects of carbon dioxide, man-made CO2, that's this curve right here, is what's responsible for most of the rise. The paper was pretty persuasive, and it was one of several. But to be science, you have to explain all the data, not just some of the data. What I'm interested in and what I've been um, involved in understanding for many years is this curve right here. What it shows is that 
there's a rhythm to the sun, first off, and you may have heard of that rhythm. Roughly every 11 years, the sun changes. In fact, that sunspot movie that I showed you is a plot of, of the change in the number of sunspots. This is a change in the number, in, in the brightness of the sun or the luminosity. Well, what's the rest of the data? If we take the sunspot record and we go all the way back to Galileo's time, we'll find out that that rhythm isn't actually very regular. There was a period of time in the late 1600s when sunspots vanished for 40 years, and it wasn't because we, forgotten, we forgot what a sunspot was, it was because they literally vanished. Another period of time in the early 1800s when they almost vanished, and then they've fluctuated since then. These two blue lines up here represent the, the dots that I showed, the peaks of the brightness of the sun that I showed you in the previous graph, and they show you that actually, when there are more dark spots on the sun, the sun is apparently brighter. That's a mystery. But the real interesting feature of these data is that if we were to ask the question, well, what was the climate of the Earth doing? And we don't have good climate measures. Economics are used to measure lots of things, and it turns out that the economics of wheat production might actually be our best measure of what the climate's doing. There's a sequence that's been studied for many years, and it shows the cost of wheat adjusted for inflation in Europe going back to 1200 to 1900. And the big jump in the price of wheat happened at the time of the Maunder minimum, the time of the Dalton minimum. That's suggestive. Is there, is there a causal reason for it to happen? There is, right? When there aren't any sunspots, remember sunspots make the, make the sun appear brighter. What do you think the temperature of the sun does? It gets cooler. Somehow dark spots make the sun look brighter. When they're not there, it should be cooler. The growing season um, is shorter and the cost of wheat goes up. So this connection is certainly very different than Judas' model because it says that the sun is in fact a very significant influence of what happens in climate, at least as measured by the indicators that, that have any long-term information, like the cost of wheat. There's another data set that goes back even farther that we have to understand. If you, go to, if you go to ice core drillings and you extract, for example, a little sample of the water, the frozen ice that's there, we can measure the temperature of the ocean that produced that water. And here's a plot that goes back, that's 160,000 years. This is the present, and this is just the, the, the recent, the last 10 to 15,000 years. The temperature in recent years has been almost 10 degrees warmer than it has over this period of time. Well, you know what that is. That's, we call that the interglacial. This is the ice ages. The temperature of the Earth has been a wildly fluctuating quantity. This change in temperature here is 10 times larger than the change in temperature over the last 30 years that we've attributed to CO2. But more interestingly in this curve is this plot that shows the amount of carbon dioxide trapped in those gases as a function of time. Look what's happened to that. The amount of carbon dioxide is also wildly variable, and it's wildly variable correlated with the temperature of the Earth. And I'll leave it to you to think about what that might mean. But certainly, the number of campfires that we've had since 10,000 years ago isn't, isn't enough to do that. Okay, so hold on. What does all this mean? <clears throat> well, there's more to this story, right? All we're doing is we're plotting curves on top of one another. This is an interesting curve. This is the number of Republicans in the Senate from 19, I don't know, that's about 1960 to 1990. It's even more interesting if I show you the number of sunspots on the sun. <laughs> so what do you make of that? It's probably not true that sunspots cause Republicans. On the other hand, when you look at data and you ask, what does it mean, you have to find the explanation. <laughs> Correlations are not explanation. And if you look at enough curves, you can find something that lies on top of another curve. And you, as citizen scientists, can do that exercise. You can look at data and you can, you can evaluate this question. Is there a causal relation? How do you test it? Well, let's plot the sunspots and the Senate data from the last few years. There it is, okay? There's no correlation whatsoever. I selected the data, so that's what you would see. You don't have to listen to an authority. You have at your disposal 
all the information you need to make your own decisions. And in this case, it's pretty clear. Correlations can be scientific models only if they have predictive power, meaning you can predict the future because of them, and if they illuminate causal explanation. Okay, so where are we at? What have we learned? Judith's model is a good explanation of the last 30 years. It's based on an enormous amount of computer data calculations, but it doesn't really explain all of the data that we know about the Earth's climate over longer time, time spans. And the issues, the issues that I think we're, we, we know we're faced with is that the climate has never been stable for very long. Civilization developed in the last 20,000 years, perhaps because of an accident, that climate was very stable. It certainly was never stable, at least as measured by ice, ice core drillings, as stable as it is now any time in the past. There are lots of puzzles that we still don't understand related to the sun. If it's true that the sun drives the climate to a degree that has not yet been appreciated, we need to understand things like why it is that dark sunspots foretell a brighter sun, and in earlier times, the solar effects apparently dominated climate change. Larger fluctuations in the greenhouse gases occurred in the past and with much larger changes in the temperature. And those were obviously not man-made changes. Is that a correlation or is it a cause? I leave it to you to think about that. I think that the answer to these questions, because it's science, is observation. We're on the verge of making an investment in the most powerful instrument, most powerful telescope mankind has ever built. And it's likely, it's possible, that it could come to Haleakala. It's an observational tool which will allow us to look into the cores of sunspots and measure the effects of the energy that radiates out into space through the magnetism. It will literally expand our ability to understand the sun to a degree that hasn't been matched with a jump in our capabilities that we haven't seen since the time of Galileo. And it alone is the is the tool that will unravel the sun's atmosphere and tell us the causal connection between these changes in the sun and what happens on the Earth. So I hope I've left with you um, some data and perspective that you can use in your own scientific investigations. I hope that you continue those investigations and adopt the view that you don't need to listen to authority, including me. The data is there in front of you. It's at your fingertips, and I hope we all become better citizen scientists into the future. Thanks for listening.